So what is going on guys, it's your boy Nistro here, and this past weekend, me and some good friends of mine woke up before dawn to take a two hour drive to the Kurwan Game Store to attend the Catskill Regionals of the Phantom Nightmare season. This was our second time going there for a uh, regional and it's a pretty nice area where it has like a little rows of shops and stuff. So there was good food around and the store itself is pretty cool. I had a lot of stuff that I think is kind of worth the travel to get there. They got like just about every card game, manga, comics, merch, singles, even some GBA games. We got there, we signed up for the event with like little to no issues. They hit like 255 this time when it was like two months ago. They were at like over 300 people and normally their cap is like 250. The store can hold more than 250 people, but the preferred amount is 250. We pulled nothing from our entry packs, right? But that's a sign of good luck in my eyes. If you pull something broken from your entry packs, that is like a sign that you're not gonna do well at that event. I don't know why, it's just my personal superstition about packs at large events it's like you cannot pull well and do well but i mean it's better to pull well and do bad than it is to not pull well and to do bad anyway <laughs> it's kind of like a mixed bag you know like you win some you lose some some people just lose it all the event started early this time two months ago the event started like two hours late at like 12 p.m so we had to raw dog all the rounds at once whereas like this time because we started a little earlier we got a one hour lunch break between like round two and three and it was nice to be able to like walk around the place a bit to see like the local shops and stuff and a little pizza shop that we were able to visit as, as a new yorker pizza was all right it wasn't anything special but I, I traveled with uh my friend from dual humor who's uh in a indefinite hiatus from making content but he's a pretty good guy and uh he may get into making content again at some point in the future so we'll see and yeah it's it's not just you know dual humor that was there uh you know big names like pack a shunping if if you go to any regionals in like the tri-state area you're probably gonna see shunping there he's been to like every regionals that i've been to and it just feels so weird because it feels like i know him like i don't actually know this man but i just see him so often it's even like before we left like after the event was over i even saw pack record his uh top 16 deck profile i didn't want to be too much of a stalker so i only got like a few seconds of footage otherwise the event went pretty smoothly for me so i want to break down what i played in this event and to break this down very simply, what I played was Goblin Biker Horus, or Goblin Biker Punk Horus. It's more of like a monster mash of rank three pile plus Horus. I guess we can just start with the main deck because I didn't really make a Goblin Biker guide yet. So I picked up this deck maybe like a week after Phantom Nightmare came out. I realized the cards were really inexpensive and I wanted to play an Armadic Seed deck since the Armadic Seed stuff came out. So. I figured I was already very familiar with rank three pile because I was experimenting with rank three pile even before the Goblin Biker stuff was revealed to be coming to, to even OCG just because I was messing around with the Armadic Seed stuff. So to have a deck that could play the Armadic Seed stuff that was pretty affordable, a really interesting deck that I've had the pleasure of playing for the past month or so, and it's finally my time to share it. Now, I did get fourth place at a YCS qualifier around like two weeks ago, but I didn't want to share that list yet because that list wasn't complete and it also didn't have the horror stuff in it. Starting off, and this might be a shock to some of you, we're only playing one of each goblin card in the main and we're not even playing Grand Bash. I used to be on Grand Bash for the Beatrice and Lars combos, but I decided to take those out because very simply, this deck has one main function and that is to make a single negate so that you don't lose to either Droll or to Nib and then for the rest of your hand to just combo off one to two cards. So any two level threes in this deck basically equals four to five interruptions they're all like monster interruptions but that's still very effective in this format and it still got me pretty far in this event so the fact that i was able to get 37th place with this deck is a really telltale sign of like how strong this archetype is and the fact that it's not even fully supported yet means you know i'm pretty happy with how i did so the reason why i'm only playing one ofs of these two i know these three most people play ones ofs for these two i feel like i never really need to resolve more than one 
Doug Charger is only here to get Grand Entrance and to be an extender. Grand Entrance is only here to get a uh, clatter splatter or to banish from grave to detach. Any follow up past that point, I probably won't need because the Horus engine makes up for the lack of follow up that the Goblin Biker engine has. What you've come to find out when you play like pure Goblin Biker is that the deck is really hard to rebuild a board. So I needed an alternative engine like Horus to help me rebuild the board when I get into those grind game states or those turn threes after I've uh, played out my entire hand. Also, some people don't like Boomok. I think Boomok's great. Initially, I wasn't gonna play him, but I found that when I was going through the combo lines, I wanted an extra monster to attach to Gabonga on the end phase. And so I was like, you know, screw it. Let me just put Boomok back in. He's great discard material. Him plus Clodder is really effective at like detaching two from my opponent's monsters. So if they have a two material Xyz, you could potentially steal both materials from them before they even get to use the effect. So I think Boomok is still pretty strong of a staple in this deck. The list that I was inspired by is not playing Boomok. Personally, I don't know if I can agree with that decision. Uh, next off is three Tour Guide. Tour Guide's your, one of your best normal summons or the best normal summon because it gives you access to Mean Merciless, Mean Merciless to level three, and it gets to summon itself back from Grave by detaching one. So it's like the best way to start. It's actually really cool with Tour Guide because in theory, you want to open Open King Sark and King Sark to get you a interruption. But if you open Imseti, right? Because if, if the whole thing is to either play around Droll or Nib and you need to set up a negate before you search, then Imseti does not play around the Droll, but Tour Guide does, right? So if you open Imseti, then Tour Guide can cover the Imseti by making a number 75 Gossip Shadow before you can resolve Imseti. And then now you are protected from any sort of droll or like any sort of hand trap on the horse engine thanks to tour guide tour guide is definitely staying at three in this list and then punk engine so two ziamen triple foxy tune one madam spider and one dangerous gabu when i was playing this deck initially i took these out because i was like I lose to Droll so hard, I don't want to have an extra body that doesn't extend by itself and is worthless if I get Drolled. But here's the thing, this variant of the deck is so good at playing around Droll, I'm like, I have to play this because it's a free interruption. Like normally, if you only play the two Ziamen, pay six, search Foxy, Foxy discard one, two, summon the second Ziamen, that's your whole play. Now, imagine that same play where it's like you pay six, search Foxy, summon Madam, you pay another six, search an extra Imperm, basically. And now any two level threes becoming like four interruptions or five interruptions, now you get one more. It becomes like a sixth interruption simply because you're playing a Madam Spider. It's not a bad normal summon, and with Itelli being at three, you have a lot of options as to how you can utilize the Madam Spider. Like, if you already have both Siamans, if the Madam Spider's already in hand or something, then it's a really great card to just have around, and I don't regret playing it, like, at all. I think this is a really good ratio. You could probably bump Siaman to three. It's not necessary, though, right? For your one-card starters, so you have, like, your three Tour Guide, two Siaman, three Foxy Tune, and then you have the three Itelli as well. You have 11 one card starters that get you into two level threes. It's really convenient. So that's why this works so well. And I, I didn't mind playing the extra kind of like soft brick. You may side this out going second. It's per, it's personal preference if you want to side these out. Always side out a Foxy team going second as well, because sometimes I don't need it. If I'm really desperate, I'll side out one Ziamen as well, or I'll just keep like Madam two Foxy one Ziamen just so that I draw more hand traps and more like non-engine going second to like break my opponent's board. But going first, you definitely want the all 11 one card starters for the combo. So next is the horse engine, three Imseti, one Happy, triple King Sark. The list that I copied was only playing King Sark at two and I have to respectfully disagree because King Sark is in a lot of ways, like going first, this is way better than opening the Imseti. Imseti loses to too many hand traps. Too many people are on hand traps right now. King Sark only really loses to Ghost Ogre. Nobody's on Ghost Ogre in main, right? If you're going first, King Sark is the preferred draw because you activate this, drop one, drop two, 
overlay into number 90. Definitely preferable to draw the King's Arc, but I still play Imsetti at three because we still want to see it. We still want to see the engine. And I feel like that's what's, what's most important, right? We open Tour Guide and we have Imsetti, like that's cool too. We just Imsetti search King's Arc and now we have access to more interruptions instead of just not being able to have access to it at all. In theory, in a budget build, you could cut these and just play like a second Horus like Damitef and you would effectively still be doing the same thing. If you really cannot afford the Imsetis, I would personally advocate for trying like just King Sark and just dropping the Happy and the uh, Damitef just so that you still have the ability to, to access like number 90 and like actual interruptions on your turn because your extra deck has so many flex spots and so much space. When you're on this build, you can kind of afford variants, let's say. And it's like, if you draw the Horuses normally without the King's Ark, you can just drop them for like Foxy Tune or something and just bump Ziam and like up to three. And I feel like you, you'd probably be fine. Really happy with this package. It gives you a lot of ways to pivot between like Negates and even like semi floodgate and an almost dweller like rank eight that I'll show you guys once we get to the extra deck. And I'm really happy that I pick up this package for this deck. I would say King Sark at three is a staple simply because the whole point is to play around Droll and Imseti does not do that <laughs> pretty well. So you have to open like King Sark at going first and like maybe going second Imseti's better. Last two engine, one Nyan Yan, one full Armadic Seed. So this is necessary for the Armadic Seed line in the extra deck and for for Dark Knight Lancer to get its interruption. It's also really, really strong with Typhon. Typhon with one of the Armadic Seeds equipped, even like Torpedo, is kind of unfair because it goes up to like over 5,000 attack. It can be destroyed. And if it's Torpedo, the Typhon also cannot be targeted. And you can resolve both of this card's effects in the same turn. So if you summon Typhon during your turn and you still have this in Graveyard, because let's say they broke your Dark Knight Lancer or you couldn't get a Armadic Seed monster in the Graveyard, in time to resolve this before Dark Knight Lancer left the field, you could just save this graveyard effect for uh, when you go for a Typhon and then equip the torpedo to the Typhon and now it has really broken attack. I was almost able to game a Despia player who left their Quem in attack mode. I was almost able to do Typhon into Exceed Armor Fortress. That would have given Typhon 5400 attack, but when the when Fortress is equipped to a monster and it attacks a monster or it, it battles a monster, you inflict double the battle damage. So that would have been 7800 points of damage. I was 100 points off of attack from being able to game him off of a single attack that turn. I didn't go for that play because I was trying to like, I didn't want to like overextend if I couldn't go for game. So I saved it for like another play and I still ended up winning that game. But the fact that I could have done that was crazy. There have been times when I was at the YCS qualifier where I was playing against Snake Eye and that was the previous build when I, when I was playing D Fissure and it was hard for him to build a board. So what I did is I went into Typhon and then I equipped it with the full Armadic Seed and it was able to like swing for big, big damage that I was able to win in time with because it was hard for the Snake Eyes player to like keep up per se. And Nyan Yan is great. Nyan Yan is so amazing, right? So it's summonable off of Itali. Like let's say you already open your Xeomin, you could just summon the Nyan Yan because there's no point of summoning the Madam Spider off of Itali if you already have the Xeomin because then you could just search Foxy Tune summon Madam. So Nyan Yan's a way better extender. And this like just makes it so if you ever go into top deck mode and you have this engraved, you have a second level three to summon back. So this is a great discard off of your Horus, off of your punk engines. And if you discard it early, like let's say you open King Sark and you discard this early, when you normal summon Tour Guide, this can chain block the Tour Guide. So it's a really useful utility engine card that has a lot of uses. It even has like a hidden effect where if it's banished, you can target another banished card. So that's face up or face down and just shuffle it back into deck. So if any of your main engine cards get banished, like Gabonga or whatever it is, and the Anian happens to get banished instead of going to graveyard, then you can get that card back. So hand trap lineup. So we got our ghost girls, triple Ash, Bell and Mourner, just one of each, triple nib, a triple tactics, one called by, triple imperm. That's 11 hand traps and 15 non-engine slots. So that worst case scenario, I can go up to like 14 to 15 hand traps, or I could cut down on the ones that I didn't need. Like usually I only kept the nib for like game one where I didn't know whether I'd be going first or second. And for um, when I was going second, I, I usually sided out nib going first just cause it's like, I'm usually not gonna nib my own field. 
But what I did find was a really effective setup was like if I only open the Horus engine, Imseti or Kingsark, and I have nothing else but like hand traps, Horus plus Nib is like really strong because you can just end on Imseti plus Happy and just uh, have like the Nib in hand and it's a really effective setup for like baiting your opponent into like overextending because they think like, oh, well, he doesn't have anything other than a few hand traps and then you, you just like nib them at the right time and then it's really hard for them to play around. So nib came in clutch. There was even a rescue ace player that I uh, played against where both game one, he played really hard into nib and he was surprised that I was on it in main deck, but I'm like, dude, this is a regionals first off. Like, even if it's not broken against Snake Eye, it's still really effective against Snake Eye. Second off, you do expect to play a lot of Rogue in a regional. I would say maybe out of like the 250 people there, maybe only about like 20 to 30 people were, were actually on Snake Eyes. I think most people were on decks that they like wanted to play. Like, there was a lot of variants. Even like Pack himself was on like a 60 card branded list. I don't think siding too hard against Snake Eye was the right call or playing too hard against Snake Eye was the right call and i i'm really happy with this lineup the tactics i think are important called by i still think is really important the ghost girls came up so many times i do side more but even at one of they do come up and i did the math like in my deck size if i side in two more hand traps like let's say i was at 13 the chances of me opening two hand traps over 50 percent chance of me opening two hand traps it's like a coin flip that i'm opening at least two when i have 13 or more so that's why like the main deck is set up this way so that i have some really easy side outs in main like with, with like engine and i have like easy side outs for hand traps in case i don't need them i'm really happy with my hand trap lineup i took out droll completely just because for this format at first i was playing cross out and i was like cross out with droll is cool but first off drawing cross out's a brick like if you if you're not getting hand trapped cross out's just the biggest brick and secondly droll just doesn't do enough this format nib is pretty good at like at least being able to to break down boards even against like rogue decks pretty much anything that isn't voiceless or like stun can get checked by nib even like cash dealer players who get a little too like adamant about their situation so it's a really effective card at just like calling out overextenders in the game. I just think Droll isn't really that good at doing that. Maybe if people are playing hard into it, it works. Like if you're playing like the, the Fire King version of Snake Eyes, Droll is pretty effective. But so many people have moved on to the pure version of Snake Eye that I think I could get away with not playing Droll and not playing Cross Out and just finding another way to set up an interruption before I play my own turn. Time for the extra deck. And this is the big surprise, right? Um, there's only one Gabanga. I'm not playing more than one Gabanga because really you only need the one, right? So any two level threes equals one Gabanga and one Gabanga equals four to five interruptions. And that's the only math that you need to remember for this whole video. Only need the one Gabanga. Rarely in a grind game do I really need a second one or do I really care about bringing it back from graveyard. Most times your games are so quick that you either don't need the second one or like the second one just doesn't come up. You have more utility in your extra deck to like make up for the single Gabanga. Armin Exceed Package. Fortress, Torpedo, Dark Knight, Lancer. Uh, these are great. I was almost going to cut Torpedo because I felt like it just didn't do enough in a lot of hands, but drawing the card to draw it to like side ends um, was really effective. And I underestimated the targeting protection effect of this card. I got a lot more mileage off this card by keeping it in. So I would say keep in your torpedoes for now. It's a really good utility card for multiple reasons. Even though I'm not on Draco Future, if I ever was on Draco Future, Torpedo would be like the perfect card to play with the Draco Future stuff. Our monster negates, Cicada King, Gossip Shadow, and Ashura King. So when I was playing a more pile, like only rank three based version, I summoned Ashura King a lot more often. Now that I have the Horus stuff, I don't summon Ashura King as much, but 75 and Cicada King, I summon like almost every game, just because these two are always gonna be a part of your end board if you are allowed to full combo. Yeah, they're very effective at what they do. I like Cicada King a little more because the, the problem with Gossip Shadow that number 90 or that Cicada King doesn't have is that Gossip Shadow requires two materials to detach to stop a monster effect. And the reason why that's a problem is because if you have to detach two, then you can't detach materials from it preemptively to resolve any of your Goblin Biker, like Doug Charger, or your Grand Entrance. And so you have to make another Xyz on top of the Gossip Shadow to keep the Gossip Shadow alive and to be able to keep on playing with your exceed materials. So that's why it's kind of high maintenance and that's why I only make it if I don't have access 
to the um, horror stuff. But it is still really effective at what it does at playing around Nib and playing around Droll if you're able to make it before you play those cards. And that's also why I took out Terratop. Arguably, Terratop is terrible at playing around Droll on top, you know? It's a great uh, starter, don't, don't get me wrong. It's a great starter for like making the Gossip Shadow, but it's terrible at playing around certain interruptions. And you could argue like, well, if you open the King Sark and you just normal summon the Terratop and you search the Takatan board, it's just as good. And because Happy is a wind, you could summon ta uh, the Takatan board if you hard open it with the Horus stuff. So it's not even like you're, you'd be terribly off playing Terratop in your list. I was already at 42 cards. I already had 11 one card starters. I just felt like I didn't need the Terror Top. Maybe if Terror Top goes to three though, maybe that could be a different conversation. But for now, I think it, the deck's fine without it. Our rank eights, Photon Lord and Xenophon. So Photon Lord is our, you know, go to negate with the Horus engine. And Xenophon is our semi floodgate for the turn. So basically, it detaches one until the end of your opponent's next turn. He cannot be destroyed by card effects and neither player can summon monsters from a graveyard, right? So you've already summoned your two Horus monsters to make this. So you don't really need to summon anything else from the graveyard unless it's Goblin Biker monsters during your opponent's turn, but you can save those. If it means that like your opponent won't be able to like princess, they won't be able to flameberg summon back, and it really significantly weakens the grind game and the extension of snake eyes to the point where if you can make this on top of like two or three negates against snake eyes, you can probably just win the game from there. But if you're gonna do this way, I would suggest mixing it with like gossip, like going for gossip shadow first if you can, and then going into this just so you still have the protection against a nib or whatever it may be, and you're not locking yourself out of your own graveyard for no reason. Dude, I can't tell you how clutch this card came. I'm really happy this card got a reprint so that, you know, I could afford it because holy shit, the amount of work that number 90 put in this past weekend was insane. I don't, I don't know how I'd ever play the deck without, without 90 from this point on. I gotta say, like, I really love the way that this deck worked. It was, it was beautiful. It was really, I, I didn't really take like a big loss until like my final round where I played against a deck that I had no idea how to play around. And we'll get into my matchups later, but uh, 90 put in work in just about every single round, I'd say. And this is my first time playing the deck like IRL. It took me a while to pick up the horse stuff. All I could really do is do test hands and like theory it out. But like once I actually um, played it in person, it was beautiful and I don't regret it at all. Utility cards, Grand Pulse for popping uh, back row. First off, sh shout out to the homie Cookie Crips for uh, holding this card for me for years because I made him a super quantum beast deck like back in the day, like last year I met up with him again and he still had this card and I was like, holy shit, let me fucking pick this up off you. And uh, the funny thing is that this card is really good, right? It just detach one, destroy one spell and trap. I was almost going to play the super quantum blue layer in the side just so that this card could have its effect as a quick effect, because when it has blue layer, it can use its effect during either player's turn. That would make it a lot stronger against like stun decks or possibly even runic. So yeah, uh, Typhon puts in so much work. Like literally, I think I summon Typhon more than I summon Zeus. I think Typhon is a stronger exceed, just like in general. And it's so funny because I'm playing a goblin deck. I'm never scared of my opponent's Typhon because I have these guys to steal the Typhon's material before it can activate. As I mentioned earlier, I have the full armor exceed to boost up my own Typhon's attack. And it's just so convenient to be able to have like a Typhon that can do so much and could like one exceed overlay. Like that's that's the real reason why Typhon's the GOAT in this deck is because it's a one monster overlay. You don't have to use two plus monsters to make it. And I feel like that's the reason why it should be kept as a staple in, the, in this deck. But Zeus is cool too, right? I, I, You know, it's not like I don't summon Zeus. It's just, it has less utility. Funny enough, I did resolve the second effect of Zeus once this event during against like Voiceless Voice, I believe. And it was kind of funny because he was like, wait a minute, Zeus does that? I was like, yep, it, it sure does attach a material from deck. And I, I believe I attached like either Nyanian or something from deck. And it was, it was pretty funny. So, but yeah, both, both of these staples in the deck. And now we have three cards left and these are my three flex spots. So these are the three cards that I think you could be anything, but the, uh, but you know, I'll show you what they are and why I play them. So first off down nerd. And the reason why this is a flex spot and not a staple is because there is no rank three that like protects itself from battle except for fortune tune. But for fortune tune to do that, it has to detach one, meaning fortune tune is going to have two materials. If you overlay down nerd on top of fortune tune, 
and Deuce on top of Downward, that's only three materials. So Downward really doesn't do a lot. It's very rare that you will use a monster with two materials to make Downward. What Downward's really here for is when you have the Exceed monster with zero materials left. With Gabonga, if, if Gabonga has no materials left and I like overlay Downward, then overlay Zeus, now that's two materials, right? So now it has, now Downward makes a little more sense. So I think normally Downward is not a staple in this deck. I think Downward's like one of the most cuttable cards in the deck, but just as a flex spot and just to like help me with uh, certain situations, when you have those like zero Exceed material monsters and you need something to overlay, to make a two material Zeus, Downer is your girl. So my second flex spot was number 38. Going into this event, my predictions for what I was gonna face was Snake Eye, Voiceless, Shifter Dex, and Runic Stun. I didn't really expect Branded, but I played a lot more Branded than I thought I would. And for the most part, I never actually played a stun deck there was one guy on like this weird horse kaiju deck but that that wasn't really a stun deck and so the reason why i would play this over number 23 in like theory is because this steals the spell as a material and so the spell doesn't go to graveyard meaning hugin can't interact with this fountain can't interact with this they have to straight up negate this card otherwise i'm taking their spell card as a material it helps just in like the long game or in the grind game against like runic decks to be able to play a card like this i never actually summoned it but i'm happy that i had it around because uh if i would have played against runic sun i would have been i would not have been like scared out of my life i was like oh what am i gonna summon what am i gonna summon it's like oh shit i got 38. i would play number 23 though because the only other thing i was concerned about was like evenly so I would personally say like if you want to beat like evenly number 23 might be better. You can't go into Zombie Stein because Zombie Stein requires two darks, but number 23 can negate anything, but number 23 has to negate the first thing there that your opponent activates that turn. So that's that's the only difference. Like number 23 can can negate anything, but it has to be the first thing that they use whereas 38 can negate spells pretty conveniently. So that's why I kept it. And the final flex spot, which won't really make a lot of sense when you consider the cards in my main deck and my extra deck, is not SP Little Knight, actually, because I sold my SP Little Knight to make the money back that I spent on it, but was actually a Baron. And yes, it's the lowest rarity Baron I could find. This, this is my last one. All the ones I had from rarity collection, I fucking traded all of them. My super rare Baron. So the whole idea of playing Baron I'm like, dude, I have level three tuners. A lot of people are, are on cards like Fenrir right now. And if I could just tactics of Fenrir, summon like one of my Xiamans or Madame Spider, or even like normal summon one of my ghost girls, I could make a Baron and in like a simplified game state, this could be really effective at like stopping my opponent from playing the game. So it was a really funny card to play. And it actually did come up in one game where I won that game because I played Baron but not in the way that I would have expected. I do also play Pankatrops in the side deck, and that's another level seven that can summon itself, but I never was able to make Baron using the Pankatrops. I did drop Pankatrops a few times, but I was never able to make the Baron using it because it just would have been too awkward to use my normal summon to make the Baron. I kind of just kept it. I really do not regret playing this, if, if I'm being completely honest, and I think I'm gonna keep it in the extra deck for now for those very fringe situations because most times like these i never summoned these two throughout the entire event like these two i did just straight up did not summon you could replace these easily baron i actually summoned and it came up and it got me a a, a win maybe these two could i could swap out for like the draco future package or maybe something else but i'm not too sure but against runixon i feel like this is too essential so maybe something else i could take out i'm not too sure yet we'll we will have to see but that was the extra deck. Time for the side deck. This is my field center throughout the event, but you guys have seen this before if you watch my Rescue Ace deck profile. It's my token, and there's my DBS Broly deck divider. Dude. Anyway, uh, so double Pankatrops. I almost forgot this card wasn't a three because I was so ready to like side in three of these, but then I was like, wait a minute, this card isn't actually a three. That was just my ban list prediction. <laughs> so the play Pankatrops a two, a yeah, really great card um almost was able to make a baron with it but i don't regret playing this it's just able to do too much and i like it a little better than fenrir because again 
not playing it to droll is kind of the name of the game with this deck. So Panko Chops isn't playing to droll, so I love this card. We have our uh, second Ghost Bell. I only play one because I just want the extra protection against like Snake Eyes, and that's really it. It's really just here as extra protection against Snake Eyes not really here for uh, any other reason. I, I didn't really like, preemptively think of any other reason to play this. Two Druid Swarm, one Magnema. Initially, I was gonna play three Dru Druid Swarm, but I eventually came to the idea of like, I don't wanna play too much of the same card, right? Like, you know, the theory of one-ups where you don't wanna draw multiples of the same thing. I have a lot of hand traps that can deal with a lot of situations, and I don't wanna draw multiples of the same thing because then I can't use the multiple of the same thing, right? Like Ash is really the only exception because Ash is really good and so is Nib because you want to draw Nib if you're going second. These guys just are really strong, especially like if you want to go for game and your opponent just has something in their graveyard that you can banish like during battle phase. You can just like uh, activate Abyss Deal from hand so you can play around Nib. It was really cool. I was actually able to win in time against a voiceless player because I had these two on top of like somewhat of a full combo. Triple Cosmic for stun. Yes, these are commons. I never actually needed to side these in. What I mean is that it was never like mandatory to, to side these in, but it was, but I was up against voiceless and voiceless almost never plays into Nib. So I'm like, I just need something else that like is just as effective, like other than the Druid Swarms, because Druid Swarms like, you know, clearly Bell, you know, clearly pretty well. Cosmic Cyclone is also very effective against that deck, getting rid of the trap, getting rid of the barrier so I could target their monster. Next, we have our tactics cards. So we have, I only have the one thrust. Uh, and so I'm playing the one lightning one evenly. The reason why I can commit to like two of any of these is because normally I'd rather play two evenly than lightning, but because we're on a Xyz deck, lightning is inherently stronger thanks to Zeus. I kind of just thrust and I kind of just let the game decide which one is stronger. And I was only able to resolve Lightning Storm once. It was against Rescuers. He kind of bricked, and so did I. But I had a thrust, and I was like, well, I can't search the Grand Entrance, because I already have that. So uh, what can I do? And then I just set Lightning Storm, because I was going second, and I sided these in. And then, like, come next turn, he had nothing else. Come, come my turn, I fucking Lightning Stormed him. It was just kind of funny, because I Lightning Stormed two of his Rescuer spells and traps. And then like on the following turn, he was able to go into turbulence and then actually able to get the game from there. Like, so I did kind of goof with that lightning storm because I wasn't able to go for game that turn, but I definitely don't regret playing this ratio. I do like having a thrust. I mean, the thrust is like, okay, it's not amazing unless your opponent has like a really big board and no more omnis left. That's really the only time like thrust is like perfect, but otherwise it's like, you can probably just play more board breakers over thrust if you only have the single copy. It could probably be fine because it could turn into any board breaker. So it's pretty cool. And then lastly, uh, to close it out, the triple solemn. So the reason why I was talking about number 23 and like evenly is because I was like, dude, I have like no Omni gates. Now that I'm not on Lars anymore, I felt a little insecure about like being able to actually stop my opponent from like just straight up breaking my board. And I'm like, I, I just need something strong that just says no. And there's no better card for that than Judgment, like, unironically. So that's why I ended up playing the three Judgment in the list. And uh, I always side these in going first. Like, you can take up the nibs and put these in. And it it, it works like a charm. Like, honestly, I, I, I just... I play this maybe, like, two or three times during the event, during, during, during the whole day. And uh, every single time, I was able to win the game when I resolved Psalm Judgment. So really great card like on top of all the negates that you can already make solemn is like the perfect final touch to your end board that like just makes it like really hard to play through and i'm really happy with how well this deck did um, so i guess i'll start to go into my matchups round one i played against snake eye and uh i lost one two that was my first loss right he had all the outs um he had cross out he had nibs when I didn't have interruptions. Or no, he had nib plus imperm. Uh, game three, so I was not able to protect my combo lines. The the game where he went first and he had a cross out for the Ash plus was able to play through, I think a mourner as well. It was really like discouraging because there was really nothing I could do. He was still able to go full combo and end on like five plus cards in hand. After playing through two interruptions, it was crazy. Round two, off of one loss, I played against Horus Kaiju. 
but I 2-0'd. Lots of misplays from both sides, but I do remember I did make the Santa Fond against him, basically because I saw he was on Horus, so I basically locked him out of his graveyard. He was also playing like Gizmic Orochi, and he, was, he wasn't he was able to bring that back, and it was a really weird matchup, but around three, I played against Branded, and we drew in time. It was like 1-1, one, one, and then game three, it was like, just as we were about to start game three, time was called, and neither of us had any time cards in our list, because my whole philosophy, the reason why I didn't use any time cards is because I'm like, I I play, like, my most of my rounds do not go into time. Like, either I lose quickly or I win quickly. There's there's rarely times, unless I'm going second, that, like, the, the game plays out longer than it should. But we looked at both of our hands, and he kind of bricked, but he drew Super Poly, and I have, like, Pink, plus, like, a way to make, um, you know, like, Typhon and stuff. And he said he would, or no, I had like uh, a Bestial plus plus Pankatrops in hand, and like I I probably could have made like Baron, I could have uh, did some did some cool stuff. So I I don't know how that game could have went. It's tough that we didn't get to play it out. Uh, round four, I I went two one against Rescue Ace, a really cool guy. Uh, he he you know gave me compliments on on the field center. Game one and three, he played way too hard into Nib. And I was just able to win both games from there. Uh, just unfortunately, like Rescue Ace does fold the hand traps. You have to respect hand traps. I know Shunping was talking about like a Horus Rescue Ace list. Maybe that could be interesting just for getting like the number 90 out and also like discarding cards from hand. I feel like that could probably work out. Or like if, if Rescue Ace had a way to make to like make like an Appaloosa before they started their turn, that could also be something like Rescue Ace players could look into. I feel round five, I played against Rika Plant. And it was the 60 card variant. And I don't know where he got his list from. But like, okay, so game one, he had really solid combo lines. And I didn't draw any like hand traps. So he ended on so many interruptions. Like he put the fear of God into me. I'm like, holy shit, how am I supposed to beat this, right? Game two, I go first. He couldn't, I, I didn't really draw that well, but... He couldn't play past like one or two interruptions. Like he couldn't play past Imperm plus something else, basically. And so he just immediately skipped game two. I was like, holy shit. Okay. And then game three, that's the game where I opened nothing but Horus and hand traps. And this is where it was kind of funny. He went first. He couldn't play through a single hand trap, right? Like he started like Small World to search like Roja Archer. And uh, I waited until he summoned out the new Aroma... Rosalina, I think its name is. The bitch with her feet out, her fucking toes all kookly. And, and yeah, I just mourned the Rosalina. He had no play other than Link 1 into Dryas. And that was it. So I opened nothing but Horus, right? So what I did is like, instead of overlaying into uh, rank eight, I just sat on MCD plus Happy because I had an Imperm in my hand, but I knew he searched Rose Archer. And I'm like, okay, this is actually pretty funny. I set the Imperm. I set one more. I had something else, I believe. Maybe Call by the Grave. Yeah, yeah, it was Call by the Grave. I called by the Grave plus Imperm, uh, plus the Horus package. So now it's his turn again. When I attacked, he he used the Dryas' effect to summon out like a monster from his deck. And I was like, or Grave or something or whatever. I was like, okay, cool. Whatever the hell Dryas does when he takes damage. I, actually, I think he summons out the Sunbind Healer. Actually, I, I think that's what it does. And now it's his turn again. He summons a monster. I Imperm it. And after... Attempting to imperm his monster, he activates his Rose Archer. Rose Archer destroys my imperm, and then both my horse monsters trigger. So I was able to send what his link to the graveyard, and I was able to grab back both my mortar and my imperm. It was great. I fucking and he was like, "Holy shit, they do that!" And I was like, "Yep, <laughs> it's it's tough out here." Uh, after that, he linked one with the Rosalina, and uh, or he he didn't link with it. He summoned another one, I believe off of like Jasmine, I think. And I was able to call by the grave, the Rosalina that he had in graveyard because he used one before he got a second one. And that was just GG's. That's when time was called and he, he was there. There was no way he was like breaking through. Like he, he didn't have any, any other plays. And I was just asking him, I'm like, are you sure like 60 cards? Is, is there no way to like slim that down with Ricka now like I know you guys still have a lot of starters but like that 
makes you too vulnerable to hand traps, doesn't it? Like you're you're spread too thin, right? So round six, uh, now I'm on kind of something of a win streak. Ever since round two, I didn't take a loss. So round two, I won. Round three, I tied, but you know, there's no guarantee that I, I would have lost that. Round four and five, I've won. So round six, I go up against Branded again. Game one, I overwhelmed them with like too many interruptions. They had no hand traps. I still made the negate like the 90 and the uh, 75 before I played my turn, but they were not able to break through the boards. Game two, uh, he went first and I opened Ghost Bell, so I felt pretty good. He, he had a line to go into Branded Lost plus Albion. And he fusion summoned the Albion on my turn. Come my standby phase or draw phase, whichever, he fusion summoned the Albion. And because Brandon Loss is on the field, it makes my ghost spell useless. Because even if even if he didn't chain block it, I still can't respond when a monster is fusion summoned. So he has that just complete free chain link to do whatever he wants, and I can't do a thing about it. So he was able to summon the puppet on me. And I drew nothing but engine. Other than that tour guide, I mean, other than that ghost spell. So uh, I, I took that loss. And then uh, game three, same thing happened. I made a board. He didn't really draw too many hand traps or none, I don't think. And he couldn't break through the board. It, it, it did get a little risky because I did solemn when there was only like a few minutes left in a round. This dude was pretty chill. I, I knew he wasn't going to like try to slime me because I definitely would have called judge if he would have taken. Because he had like four to five minutes left when it was his turn and I solemned. And like, it, it, like I could tell, like two or three cards left, like there was nothing left in his hand that he could do. So he just passed turn, and I was able to just completely get the game from there using like bis deals and stuff. So that was round six, right? So still, I'm on something of a win streak. Round seven comes around, and I'm playing voiceless. Game one, I lost pretty hard. I couldn't beat the basic setup with like the guardian and the continuous spell plus a continuous trap plus hand traps it was just too much for me like game two i was able to play the full the full combo game two um and he he couldn't break it right like it was like 90 plus the four to five interrupts off the combo and then game three the only engine he opened was a single diviner so i impermed his diviner and he had to pass turn right so i went z Amin and i got drolled as i was explaining earlier i stole his diviner with tactics and then uh, I tribute Ziamin to summon Foxy Tube with Foxy Tube's effect. And then I Synchro Baron. And then it was like the fakest win. <laughs> like I, I put that down in my notes, like fakest win ever, which was pretty funny. So I'm on like a, a four win streak at this point. I'm doing a lot better than I thought I would. And then round eight, I face like basically the final fucking boss, which is which was Bright Pearly. I couldn't get through their immense amount of like interactions, uh, nor smashers. They had Sprite Red, IP, plus draw four. And they were able to play through a nib because they uh, they made like one pearly exceed. And then they also had Sprite Blue. So it's like they have like the one pearly monster. Uh, the pearly exceed was summon number two. Sprite Blue was summon number three. Sprite Red was summon number four. And I, I still had the nib in hand. So I had to make the concession of, well, he summoned out like Jet and he searched like Sprite Smashers. And after linking off, the Sprite Jet and the Sprite Blue, he went into Sprite Sprind. He activated Sprite's effect to summon more monsters from deck. And before he summoned out his two level twos, I was like, fuck it, let me just nib right here so that he loses the access to the Sprind. It was crazy because he still was able to get, you know, to a pretty half decent board with like the Purleap. So he went like IP plus two level one Purleys on field. Or like, yeah, plus two of the regular Purley plus red plus Nor. And he was able to like draw four cards. I drew like Boom Mock and I was able to start like detaching from his field. I also drew like the, the King Sarcophagus, but I thought he was going to IP the King Sarcophagus away. He just smashered on it. And I kind of forgot he had smashers. Now, now I'm going to hold you. There were so many like cards he was drawing and so, so much shit on his field. I forgot he had smashers. So I activate King Sark, discard one, which I discarded Nyan Yan. So it, it, I didn't really lose much by playing into the smashers but i was trying really hard to bait the ip and i just couldn't do it the first thing i did is a boom mock detached the level one per lily under his nor so that nor is no longer a quick effect which was a really good play but the issue is that he had the straight pearly street and he had the my friend pearly so i didn't want to just remove the pearly from the uh the, the nor from the field 
because I didn't want to just trigger the my friend probably so that he could add back three because I knew I wasn't going to beat him that turn. That was the one game I kind of regret not playing the spell Armored Exceed because the spell Armored Exceed would have been able to get me to trigger Dark Knight Lancer and swallow the Noor without targeting it and not having to rely on Zeus because the way that the, the situation was is I was able to go into battle phase and he didn't really stop me from going into battle phase. He he didn't care at all. I, I was able to go for a Shuriken because I was able to make three level threes. And because Nor was no longer a quick effect, it was like I was really only dealing with red plus IP. I was able to swing into the red and the, or I was able to swing into the IP plus like the two per lilies. I believe like he was saving the red effect, but uh, when I went to battle phase, he didn't try to use his, his IP or anything. So I, I swung into the IP plus the, the two regular pearlies. Main phase two, I attempt to trigger Gabanga to steal the Noor, but then I, but then he reminded me he had the field spell on field, so I couldn't do much about that. And that kind of like really hurt the uh, game state that we were in because that stopped me from being able to get rid of the Noor completely. And because he was able to keep the Noor, like I, I was able to make a, like a board of like three or four interactions going through that um, situation, but it just wasn't enough to like get through his, his entire board. So it was kind of tough. If I would have had the spell arm and exceed, I would have been able to out the Noor without triggering the My Friend Pearly and playing around the Pearly Street. And I feel like that probably could have gotten me the game because the reason why he was able to win the next turn was because he was able to Noor, detach, take a month, take my Shuriken as material and fucking do all this nonsense. And it was just way too much. But in theory, I could have gotten that game won if I would have played better, but I did not play against Pearly a lot. So game two, I actually sided in bestials and i realized how terrible of a side in that was you're supposed to side into dd crow because the pearlies rarely, rarely ever hit the graveyard it's the spells that you care the most about so it's dd crows over bestials that win you that matchup i'm not sure if i would switch out the bestials for dd crows just because bestials just seem like a better option but i don't think dd crows would be terrible either i might have to do more playtesting but what was so funny is i only opened horus plus bestials and it was just not enough to stop him from going full combo and i also let him go first because i now that's that's one thing i did with like one of the branded players i let them go first uh, after like oversighting so I let the branded player go first after I lost a game and they oversighted so they kind of bricked moral of the story is uh sprite pearly is a broken deck and uh it put the fear of god into me like I was I was almost like scared of aroma after playing it in that set but uh what really scares me now is sprite pearly like that is a really strong competent deck and in game one, you could argue that he, he got kind of lucky by drawing blue, right? Like, but even if it would have been jet, right? Even if it would have been jet instead of blue, like, he still would have been able to, like, play the turn almost the same way. Basically, he wouldn't have had the smashes and he would have been, just had to summon IP, not IP, uh, SP, but... I guess uh, I'll show you guys a quick combo. Someone asked me how two to three cards is any sort of negate, right? So, King Sark, right? Let's say you have two cards that are discards that you don't care about, right? Like, let's say you have two discards plus two level threes, right? So let's just say for the sake of argument that it is Xeomin and another card you don't care about. Let's just say it's three nib, right? You can King Sark, and King Sark can send one, send two. You're going to send the Happy and the Imseti. Always summon the Imseti first to play around Bistials, and then you can summon out the Happy. And then you overlay into number 90. This is why I prefer King Sark, right? Because now you just made a 90 without playing into Droll or Nib. And that's that's what's most important. Now you summon Xeom and now you can pay six. Search Foxy. So Foxy can discard itself for cost. Just remember that if Foxy is negated, you actually don't send the second card from hand to graveyard. Send one, send two, summon out Madam. Madam pay six at Gabu, right? You're sitting on two negates right now. So you got 90 and you have Gabu. Now you're going to overlay into big Gabonga. Gabonga is going to activate. going to search you Doug. You can activate Doug, detach one. Doesn't really matter which because uh, you didn't summon tour guide. Doug effect, going to add grand entrance. You're going to overlay the Gabonga into fortress. 
Now, it doesn't really matter the order, right? You can use Fortress Effect, search the full Armadic Seed, and then you can activate the Grand Entrance to search Clatter. And then by detaching one, you can summon Clatter, and then unsummon, Clatter's gonna trigger, target the Gabonga and Grey Bear to summon it back, right? So you still have the full Armadic Seed. And you get to overlay into Dark Knight, and you get to overlay these two into Cicada King. And then you can go end phase Gabonga to attach a boom mock. Now, if you do it like this with Ziamin, you're gonna have no cards left in hand, but you're gonna have so many interruptions that it kind of doesn't matter. If you start with like tour guide, then when you tour guide, you may, you're may you still gonna have one card left in hand, you just won't have Gabu. So without Gabu, right? Like let's say we went tour guide instead of Ziamin, this is one card in hand. So one swallow, when a monster detaches, it gets to swallow. One Dark Knight Lancer, monsters equipped, it gets to swallow, non-targeting. One Cicada King, when your opponent activates a monster effect, it gets to target a monster and negate its effects. And then full armor exceed is, is our other two interruptions. So basically, Cicada King is going to be the first thing to pop off, right? So when Cicada King pops off, you detach Clatter. Once Clatter's in Graveyard, right? So that that's always going to be first. Once Clatter's in Graveyard, uh, at any point during their main phase, you can detach one. I like to summon back like Boom Mock, or you can detach Boom Mock, or you can detach Dove Charger. It really doesn't matter. Detach summon, effect on res, summon out boom mock. Uh, on res, activate full armonic seed. So these two activate in the same chain, actually. So you, you could chain block Gabonga with Clatter or Clatter with Gabonga, however you want to do it. And then full armonic seed overlays these two to go into another negate, which you can go into 75. Let's say 75 detaches. There's a bunch of options you have here, but for your Dark Knight Lancer negate, you're, you're gonna use the full arm and exceed effect from Graveyard, right? You can banish itself, target and exceed on your face up field and an exceed monster in your graveyard, equip the one from Graveyard face up field to the, to the first one that he targeted. So normally you wanna detach this fortress so that the fortress is the one that you are equipping to Dark Knight Lancer. But as I've said sometime before, that's not always necessary. Like sometimes this, just your front row plus 90, because you want to use your 90 negate to get your horse monsters in graveyard, right? Like you want to detach Happy, you want to detach the Inseti. So that's one, two, three, four interruptions that you have here. If you have the Goblu, it's five. And then if you have the Dark Knight Lancer, it's six. Now, if you save your Dark Knight Lancer detach, right? For either Grand Entrance, or if you want to bring back Boom Mock and detach it during your opponent's turn, you can. And then you can banish full Armored Exceed equip fortress to any uh, monster and then dark knight lancer is going to trigger swallow swallow one so what is normally four to five negates becomes five to six negates depending on if you have gabu and if you don't have gabu then you can potentially have like a hand trap or if you already opened like one of the imseti or the happy with the king sark then you only discard one to set up a 90 and so that means that you could potentially have another hand trap in hand as well and there is a lot of hands where I still had like one to two hand traps, like an imperm or something. Like there was one hand where I, I still had double imperm on top of everything else uh, because I went tour guide into the Imseti. So I went tour guide into 75 before I went for the 90. And so I was able to have like a lot more extension in hand or a lot more cards left in hand after the turn was done. So that's the five to six negate combo. And it really doesn't get much more complicated than that going first. Going second, obviously, there's a lot more variance, but um, I'll be uploading a uh, Goblin Biker guide sometime next week because it's going to take me a while to put all the combos and stuff together. And now that, you know, I've shared my deck list um, and made a little vlog, I feel like I've done my piece, said my piece. So that'll be all for me this has been your boy Nistro here hope you guys enjoyed the very uh long 37th place regional fourth place ycs qualifier uh deck profile <laughs> um i'm loving goblin biker and i'm really excited to see what the future support has for us um i know we're only getting two cards in uh, Legacy of Destruction. I hope we get more in Infinite Forbidden. I mean, just even one level three extender or even like one more uh, Goblin Biker card, maybe a field spell, maybe another level three could be really effective in like helping this deck work more as like a pure deck because the fact that I'm only playing ones of each is like the craziest part to me. It's the fact that, and also the fact that it worked, 
like i didn't even know if it would really work or not until i played it in person and it was just like so crazy that it actually worked so i'm i really love this deck let me know what you guys uh think in the comment section below this has been your boy nistro here signing out